before God and sacrifices for the people's sin. And once every year, he was able to enter into a place called the Holy of Holies. And in that place, he would offer sacrifice for the people. And before he went in there, he had to make absolutely certain that he was okay before God. No hidden stuff going on. Everything's been taken care of, lest he be struck down in the presence of God. This place called the Holy of Holies is a very, very special place. It's actually a picture of our spirit, believe it or not. In our spirit is where the Holy Spirit dwells. And thus it is the Holy of Holies. And if you look at the temple and the way the temple was constructed, you find out that the temple almost looks like us, in a sense. The temple had an outer court. And in the outer court, women could go in there, foreigners could go in there, all different people could go in to the outer court. And that outer court was almost a picture of the flesh. But then you had the inner court, and when you stepped into the inner court, there were more restrictions on who could go in there. The ones that could go into the inner court were the Jewish male men that could go in there. And this is, of course, a picture of the soul of man. And then we have the Holy of Holies. We have that holy, holy place. And you know, by the way, sometimes when we pray, I've noticed, at least in my life, I have to kind of go through a process to get there, to get to the Holy of Holies. I can't just do a Burger King drive through quickie because, you know, it really doesn't mean much. But when we sit down to really pray, first thing that's got to be put aside is the flesh. Have you ever got down to pray and all of a sudden you're starving to death? Or you get a bad headache? Or your muscles are hurting, you can't get on your knees or whatever. Your flesh is crying out, I don't want to do this. And you work past that. You work past that. And then all of a sudden, here's our minds coming into play, telling you, you have an appointment at 1030. The phone's ringing, you have to answer it. You have to do this on Tuesday. And it seems like all of these things start running around in our brains when we're just trying to clear all that out so we can get close to God. And we keep at it. We keep at it until finally we do come to that place where we enter into that holy of holies, to that spiritual place with God. See, he doesn't dwell in the flesh. He doesn't dwell in the soul. He dwells in the spirit. And in order to truly reach out and be touched by him and to touch him, I need to find myself in that place of prayer. Not just a casual, quickie, traditional bunch of words that I say, but something that truly is coming from my spirit to God. And so, even so, we see with the temple and the high priest, he was allowed to enter into that spiritual place once a year. And he could have direct contact with God in that place. They say, many of you probably know this, but they do say that they would put little bells on the bottom of their robes, the high priest, as he would enter in. And you could hear the bell ringing as he was moving about. And if you heard the bell ringing, then that means that uh, he was, if it stops ringing, then he's, he's done. He's well done. He's on the ground and he needs to be pulled out. So some say they even put a rope around his leg and when he went down, they, they didn't go in there. They couldn't go in there, so they'd drag him out. That's why the scripture tells us right here that it's so important because of this in verse 3. He himself needs to offer sacrifices for his own sins before he goes in. Now I've had people come to me and say, this is Jesus they're talking about here. It's got to be, right? Because he can have compassion on the ignorant, help those who are going astray. And he brings gifts and he does all these great things. But if we read on, we find out it's impossible. This cannot be Jesus. This has to be a man, a sinful man, because he's required to do sacrifice for himself. This priestly honor was huge in the Jewish culture with the children of Israel. 
There's a fellow that we're going to meet as we go down through these next few chapters, and his name is Melchizedek. And we're going to find that Melchizedek is a very, very interesting individual. Some of you have studied Melchizedek, and if you have, you know that there's not a whole lot to look at with Melchizedek. It's largely a mystery, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. So the high priest was appointed to have compassion, but it didn't always happen that way. You know, we read in the Old Testament over and over about how the leadership, the spiritual leadership in Israel was compromised over and over again. It was corrupted over and over again. And this whole idea behind going into the temple and going into sacrifice for sin, it almost became a business for some of these guys. Because they were charging people to get in there. They were asking people outrageous requirements to be able to go in and have the priest sacrifice an animal. Oh, well, your animal's not good enough. But we happen to have one here for $99.95. Down. And $99.95 a month for the rest of your life. You see, they were scheming the people. They were also drinking and using alcohol and all kinds of different... I mean, this is about as, as unholy as you can possibly be. So the priests also being sinners, the priests being human beings with a sinful nature, God was using them not to truly complete his plan, but to show us a picture of his plan. That's what this is all about. It's all the ironic priesthood is a picture of God's plan, of restoration, of forgiveness, of redemption. And how the high priest was the one who, who actually was a picture of Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that went in to the Holy of Holies. He's the one that's there even this morning. Sitting at the right hand of God. We like to say that he's here with us. And he is, of course. Because he's God and he's omnipresent and he can be everywhere at one time. But interestingly enough, the Bible tells us that his physical body is at the throne on the right hand of God, the place of authority. And he's there making intercession for you and for me as our high priest. So the priest would go in and he had two major functions. Function one was to represent the people before God. He was their attorney, if you will their defense attorney, and he would go in and seek mercy for the sins of the people. His other function was to speak to the people about what God has to say to the people. So he has a dual function there. He's standing as a mediator between man and God, and he's also standing there as a prophet or a messenger from God to give the words that God speaks to him, to the people. A very high and lofty position. But Jesus, we read in last week, that Jesus was superior to these men because there was no corruption, there was no uh, cutting corners, there was no trying to get rich schemes going on. It was Jesus, and it tells us that he can sympathize with you and me. And you might think, you know, how can he sympathize with us? He's Jesus. Yes, he is, but he took on a human body. And that human body that he took on felt every little feeling that you feel. It knew loneliness. It knew what it was to be persecuted. It knew what it was to be tossed to the side and betrayed. He knew what it was to love. He knew hunger, and he knew pain, and he knew hard work. He was just like us, and the Bible says in every point he was tempted. He was tempted with the possession of the world. He was tempted to eat bread so that his flesh would be satisfied. He was tempted to be the ruler of all the kingdoms of the world, which would certainly address his soulish desires to be looked up to, to stand up on the highest pinnacle of the temple and, and jump off, knowing that an angel is going to catch him. 
And suddenly all the news people are there and they're watching it and they're documenting it. And, and uh, boy, he could become world famous in no time at all. But he put that aside. You see, he laid all that aside because he knew that there wasn't anything beyond temporal blessing that the enemy was offering him. Nothing there that's eternal. Nothing there that he's going to offer you or me that will last. It's one thing you can use as a, uh, a way to find out whether your motives are good or not so good. Are you pursuing something through God that's just temporary? Maybe just to feed your own fleshly desire? Or are we seeking out things that are eternal, like Jesus said? Don't lay up your treasures on the earth. Lay them up in heaven. They're very secure up there. There's no robbers and thieves, and there's no corruption up there, and they'll be, be preserved there waiting for us when we arrive, and we will be rewarded for those things. But now we know that we have this high priest who goes before us, who is accepted by God, and he takes care of the business for us that pertains to God. And we know that the, that the Spirit gives us gifts. Gifts of the Spirit that we might operate as Christian people with the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. But this man, he says in verse 4 that no man can take this honor to himself. In other words, you can't just one day decide, I think I'll be a high priest. I wonder if they're taking applications. I want to be a high priest. Well, you know what? Only God can call a high priest. Only God can call men and women to ministry. If it doesn't come from God, then... Usually it fails. If it comes from our desire to do a good thing, it can fail. You see, it's got to be all about God calling us and us hearing that call and obeying that call and figuring out where do I fit in the scheme of all of this? Where would God have me to function in this body and in the body of the church, of course, at large? David, you know, when you start a ministry, sometimes you don't have very much help. Sometimes you only have family members, right? And they try to be faithful and they want to come and support you. And, you know, after a little while, maybe some other folks start coming in and you get all excited because there's people there. But at the beginning, it's difficult. It's difficult because this is not a, an honor or a position or a calling that I can say to myself, I think I'm going to be a pastor when I grow up. Because I want people to look up to me and I want people to think that I'm holy and spiritual and I want to make a lot of money so I can retire. You know what? None of those things are true. You can't do that on your own. Only God can call you. And you know how you find out whether or not you're called or whether you called yourself? Is, are you going to hang in there? Is your longevity going to be there? Are you going to be fruitful in your ministry? Are things growing and moving forward? And as long as we see that happening, yes, that calling is definitely on our lives. God has called us each. But when it comes to ministry, when it comes to pastors, representing the people, praying for the people, loving on the people. Nobody can do it like Jesus. Only he can do that. Now, Aaron was called by God through Moses, but Jesus is superior to Aaron because it wasn't Moses that called him or it wasn't another Jewish man that called him. It was God that called him to be the high priest. And so that's what we see in verse 5. Jesus did not glory uh, himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And he also said in another place, you are a priest forever. 
according to the order of Melchizedek. There's some important words there. He is a priest for how long? Forever. That means everything that he did as a priest is eternal. He's not, he doesn't have to come back next year and get back on the cross again. He did it one time. He died for us once for sin, for all of us. And, and it, was, it was found to be more than enough to pay the debt that we could not pay. But the Lord himself, not only was he a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which is a whole new order, we'll talk about that more, it's an order that is separate from the Aaronic priesthood. And, you know, we've talked in here a little bit about shadows and types and things like that in the Old Testament. And the Aaronic priesthood is a type and it is a shadow. And there was a time when the Aaronic priesthood became null and void because it wasn't needed anymore. It's not much different than the fact that we don't have to sacrifice animals and shed their blood because it's not needed anymore. Because Jesus was the fulfillment of all of those pictures that God gave us in the past. So God calls him something different, something separate from all of the other prophets and all of the high priests. He said, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. The only begotten son of God. You know when you read like Genesis or you read the uh, Gospels where they have the genealogy in there and you're reading so-and-so begat so-and-so and begat, 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 begat. You start saying begat in your sleep, begat, begat, begat. That's the same word we're using here. So-and-so birthed so-and-so. The father birthed and was responsible for the birth of the son through Mary. He is the only individual in history that, that was directly begotten by God. No one else, only him. He's the only begotten son. And that's why we call him the son, because he is the son in the sense that he was born. And he was born as a result of God's work, the work of the Holy Spirit in Mary. And we can make all kinds of conjectures about that, but we're not going to do that. We're going to accept the fact that God says it, and I believe it. I accept it. I might not understand how all that worked, but I believe that it's true. I believe that we can trust God's word to be true in our lives. And so he declares Jesus better than any other high priest. And as a matter of fact, he's going to enter into a whole new priesthood. A priesthood now that will fulfill the one that was just a sign or a picture. A priesthood now that's going to replace the Aaronic priesthood. And this is part of what the difficulty was with the, receive, the people that received this letter. They could not let go of their traditions. They couldn't let go. Yeah, Jesus is great and everything, but I still need to keep this feast, and I still need to do this, and I still need to wash my hands 20 times before I eat, and i got to do all this kind of stuff if I want to make it to heaven. I mean, Jesus is great, but we... See, they were caught up in this. This was a problem for them. They didn't understand grace. They didn't understand redemption. They didn't understand forgiveness. But when Jesus came and when he became our high priest and he became the only begotten son, he also became the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 7, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Now he's talking about Jesus. Now he's talking about the Lord. In the days of his flesh, 
And when did he offer up all these prayers and supplication with cries and tears? Do you remember when he did that? We know of at least one time, right? In the garden. Right before he was taken away in the garden, he did that. He cried out to the Lord and said, Father, <laughs> there's got to be another way. And if there is another way, Lord, show me right now. But if there's not, your will be done. We hear that humanity crying out on one end, and then we see the spirit crying out on the other. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be enjoyable. But nevertheless, if it's your will, I'll go through it. If it's going to accomplish what you've set out for it to accomplish, I'll do it. I'll be obedient to you, my father. And he was. And verse 8 tells us, even though he was a son, even though he was a son, it didn't give him any preeminence over the qualifications to become obedient to the things of God. That's what Jesus did. He became obedient. And his obedience created suffering in his life, even though he was a son. He didn't get any special treatment. He didn't get any padded path. He had to take the very same path that all of us take. And look at it, it says that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So what do you think he learned about it? About obedience. He learned about obedience because of the things he suffered. What, what kind of things do you think he learned? Did he learn, maybe perhaps in the garden that evening, that no matter what happens, I'm in God's hands, and I am secure there, and I know it's all going to work out just fine, and so I can be obedient, with confidence, knowing that he's going to take care of me, that he has a great plan. He's not going to let my soul rot in the grave. He's going to raise me up, even as the prophet said. And so while maybe in his flesh he had fear, in his spirit he was strong. He was having a spiritual battle that you and I will never ever have to experience, thank God. We all know about spiritual warfare. We've all been through it, are going through it, and probably will continue. And let me just say this in passing, okay? If you're here this morning and you're thinking, you know, the devil don't hassle me. I mean, I'm just going along with life, and it seems like there isn't even a devil out there. He doesn't bother me at all. If that's your situation, this, I would be concerned. I really would. Because you know what? He doesn't waste his time with those who truly aren't children of God. He puts his focus on us, who truly are God's kids. And he truly does want to neutralize us so that we can't be effective. When you have a church that's doing God's work, the church is going to be under persecution. When you're a person that's doing God's work, you're going to be under suffering and persecution. Wondering if you're doing it right. Wondering if it's making a difference. Maybe I didn't hear God's voice properly. All of these things can come into play as the enemy sits on my shoulder and says, I don't know who you think you are. You can't do this. Look at all the things that you've done. How can you ever think that you could be a servant of God? You're a sinner. And I used to listen to that guy almost every Sunday, especially on Sunday. All the way, he'd be on that shoulder. Saying, bah, 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 bah. And I was talking about it with a friend one day, and he says, you know what, I have the same problem. Yeah? He says, yeah. But you know what I do? I said, what do you do? He said, well, when he's saying all that stuff, I just agree with him. Yeah, you're right. I am a sinner. You're right. I don't deserve it. You're right. I should be going to hell. You're right. But you know what? Jesus died for my sins. Jesus bought me and paid for me with his blood. So you can make any accusation you want to make, and you have to deal with Jesus about those accusations, right? So what can we do at that point? Send him on his way. Be assured that he'll come back. He doesn't give up. 
So Jesus suffered these things in his obedience and learned that God is faithful. He learned that God is a, a God of his word and that he can be trusted completely with anything that you and I might encounter in our lives. Some of us have really seen hard things in our lives happen. And I think as Christians, we can sit back and we can say, you know what, God was there every step of the way. I might have doubted now and again. I might have been encumbered with fear, but the Spirit was there the whole time. God was there to keep me through it, hold me through it, see me through it. Jesus learned that. And in verse 9, it says that he was made perfect. It says, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus had to be perfected? I thought he was already perfect. I thought he was sinless. Huh, raises a question in my mind. How could he have to become perfect if he's already perfect? The word here, perfect, you know what it speaks of? It's talking about a completion of a plan. It's talking about a maturing, a coming together. And what Jesus did for us on that cross was that he brought the plan together of God. He brought it into its maturity. He brought it into its completion. And he brought it into its perfection. And only he could do that. He became the author of eternal life. To who? Look at your Bible. Who is he the author of eternal life for? To all who obey him. You see, this isn't some cheap uh, religion that we have. This, this belief system that we have and our relationship with God cost God everything for us to have it. It's nothing to be taken lightly. And he is the one that we want to obey. What did Jesus say when he was here? He said things like this. If you love me, you're going to do what? Keep my commandments. Not if I rule over you hard enough, I'll make you keep my commandments. No. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see, it comes willingly from us, doesn't it, when we love God? You ever sit and think, oh man, I've got to open my Bible again and read. Oh, every day I've got to do this. We should be saying, you know what, I, I want to read my Bible. I want to be around God's people. I get filthy out there in the world all week long, and I want to have a place that I can come and I can feel like I'm, I'm with the birds of a feather flocking together, right? All of us in unity with one another. How refreshing is that? Perfectly, we never ever take that for granted. He talks about God calling him to this order of Melchizedek, and then look what he says in verse 11. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, who are mature, and that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised, by reason of practice, basically is that word, by reason of practice have used their senses and exercised them to discern both good and evil. Gosh, you would think that we would already know that. But in the world we live in, it's all kind of blurred together, isn't it? It all kind of blurs together, and it's kind of hard to tell where that line between good and evil is these days. There's a big, giant area there. Not with God. Not with us. There's no gray areas. It's all very, very clear. And this is probably, you know, 
part of the saddest part of this letter that, that we could look at. He has a lot to say to them, and he's going to. He's not done yet. As we continue through here, he's going to continue sharing meat with the people. But the sad thing about it is we haven't changed very much. We're, we're still basically the same. Sometimes we become dull of hearing. Sometimes we've heard it before. I've heard this before. How many times do I have to hear the same thing? Until you get it right. That's how many times. You know, the Old Testament is filled with advice where it says, over and over and over, repeat these things. Repeat them to your children. Do things repetitively. Let them become a habit and a part of your life. Otherwise, you'll become dull of hearing. You'll find a false sense of security and obedience. Well, it will become second on the list. We want and we have the opportunity here at this church because we're adamant about the Bible, because we're adamant about verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Bible, we're adamant about making it something that we can all chew on and grow from, right? That's what we want to do. We want to maintain that. We want to hold on to that so that we don't become dull of hearing. I think it was Peter that said, when he wrote his letter, he said, you know, I know you've heard these things before, but it's important that I stir these things up in you. And it's important that we let God stir them up in us, too. Because we can be complacent. We can become dull in our spirit hearing. I had heard an analogy a long time ago, and I love it, about... You go to your refrigerator and you pull out a bottle of Italian dressing, right? And you hold it up and you look at it and, you know, it's got the oil on the top and stuff in the middle. I don't know what that is. And then it's got the stuff on the bottom. And, and do you open it up and just pour it on your salad like that? That wouldn't be very good, would it? What do you do? You got to stir it up, don't you? You got to shake it up. And you know what? Sometimes... We need that too. Sometimes we need to say, God, I trust you so much, you can shake me up anytime you want. Because you love me. And yet when you shake me up, it's going to be for my goodness. That's how much we trust the Lord. He says that these people should have been teachers by now. But they're still having to learn the basics of the faith. Sometimes it's amazing to me. I, I was at a, a conference many years ago and, and uh, was actually with Pastor Ron there. And uh, Dan Bellows was sitting next to me. And we were looking for one of the books in the Old Testament, the guy that was teaching, I think it was Chuck. And he, he said, you know, why don't we all turn to whatever it was, Habakkuk or Malachi, Haggai or whatever it was. It was one of them little teeny books at the end of the Old Testament. I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, where is it? Where is it? I can't find it. I can't find it. And I look over at Dan. He's going, where is it? I don't know. And we had to go to the table of contents and go, oh, it's on page 1,250. It really opened my eyes to the fact that there was some ignorance there. There was some unfamiliarity on my part about the book, about the Bible. Man, I, we should all be able to go, oh yeah, Hebrews, man, I know right where that's at. Oh, Matthew, I know right where that's at. To familiarize ourselves so that we can eat meat and not just milk. If you just drank milk, could you imagine? It wouldn't be a very good outcome. We need meat. We need, we need protein, gospel protein, Jesus protein in our lives. Everyone that drinks only milk is unskilled. That's big. That's really big. If you're still drinking milk and you've been walking with the Lord for a while now, ask yourself that question this morning. Am I a milk drinker 
which means I'm unskilled, and maybe that's why I have such a problem sharing my faith or understanding the things of God because I'm stuck on milk? Can I move forward? Can I sit down and have a nice big steak of the Word of God? I believe that that's what we want to seek. And when we begin to eat meat, then we can help those who are on milk. That's the whole idea, is for us to nurture them, but not for us to remain infants. Gosh, my, my oldest son, you know, he pretty big kid, and I often thought about, you know, what if something happened when he was a baby and he, he never really became an adult, and, and he's 23 years old, and I take people into his room and introduce them to him, and there he is lying in his crib. His big crib, right? He never got past being a little baby with a pacifier. But there he is, 30 years old. But he never developed. He never grew. He never matured. And I felt like, how many of us are in that crib, too? You know, the Father wants to show us and be proud of us and say, this is my servant. This is the one that I'm well pleased with. Good job good and faithful servants. That's what we want to hear. So this morning, as we wrap this up, I want to encourage you to seek out solid food. And if you have extra time this week, take a look at Melchizedek. Find out what the Bible has to say about him so you'll be a little more familiar with it when we begin to touch on it more deeply. I believe that if you know something that the person next to you doesn't know, then that's something that can be taught. We don't have to have a master's degree or a doctorate in theology to teach, do we? No. If I've got 10 cents in my hand and you've only got a penny, that means I've got something to offer you. It might not be the $100 bill, but I've got a dime and I've got something that you don't that I can offer you that I can share with you. I encourage you to step out in those areas in your life. See what kind of blessings and excitement comes when you actually do get out there and chew on a steak once in a while. Amen? Now, in a minute, we're going to have the worship team come up, and we're going to finish our worship time together. They're going to do a couple songs. And if you're here this morning and you would like to have prayer, whether it's the first or the second song, it doesn't matter. If you could just get up and just come right over here to this corner of the pew over here. There's going to be some folks that want to take you in the prayer room and pray with you. And don't leave home without it. Amen? If you need it, come and get it. We'll bill you on the way out. <laughs> Father, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you are our great high priest. Not just a high priest. The high priest. The high priest of our faith. The one who stands in the gap. The one that represents us in the court of law. The one who finds us clean, not guilty, and righteous. Only because of the robes, Lord, that you close up with. Those righteousness. Robes of righteousness that were given to us because of what Jesus did. We're so thankful. And we know this morning that those robes, they cover up a multitude of sin. We're so thankful that you did that for us, Lord. That we have a new life. And that we can see things from a whole different perspective. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.